Hello and welcome to all of our viewers in today's uh, uh, webinar. My name is Jeff Rathke. I'm the president of the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies at Johns Hopkins University. Coming to you today from Berlin, where I happen to be located, and I'm delighted to welcome all of our viewers around the world uh, for this, this session. Our title is uh, The Global Economy in 22, uh, Prospects for Transatlantic Cooperation. And I think we begin the day with the German Chancellor's announcement um, that uh, essentially that the certification process for the Nord Stream 2 pipeline has been halted uh, as a result of the, uh, the Russian recognition of, of the separatist regions of Eastern Ukraine. Uh, we are really delighted to have with us uh, a, a senior official in the economics ministry, the state, uh, uh, state secretary, Francisca Brantner, who may be able to tell us a bit more about this really momentous German decision uh, because it's the economics ministry that has the responsibility for this verification with regard to energy security. Get to that I'm sure in a moment. Uh, but first I would just like to uh, welcome you and pass the reins over to my colleague, Peter Rashish, senior fellow um, and director of the GEO. Uh, and uh, Peter, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff. And let me also welcome all of you today to today's webinar. Um, as Jeff um, referred to, uh, leaders in the United States and Germany, they are understandably focused on Ukraine, uh, where um, geopolitics, perhaps more than geoeconomics, um, may be driving events. But it's clear that both the United States and Germany are increasingly considering the role that economic policies can play in advancing their broader interests, uh, particularly in a global economy that we see as still marked by very high levels of interdependence, but at the same time, a greater competition among economic models. So as Germany um, holds the reins this year of the G7 presidency, we're looking forward to examining uh, the economic policy priorities of the new SPD Green FDP coalition in Berlin and uh, the avenues for the US and Germany to work together to promote uh, a global economic, economic order that advances their shared values and, and interests. As Jeff said, we truly have a superb group of uh, panelists today. So let me briefly introduce them to you before we begin. Uh, Francisca Brandner is Parliamentary State Secretary or Deputy Minister in the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action. Before that, she was the spokesperson for European policy and parliamentary whip of the Alliance 90 of the Greens group, as well as a member of the Committee on European Union Affairs and Deputy Member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. She has also served as spokeswoman on child and family, family policy for the Greens and as a member of the European Parliament. Before that, she worked for the Bertelsmann Foundation consulting on EU foreign policy issues. She holds a PhD from the University of Mannheim. Michael Hütte has served as director and member of the executive committee of the German Economic Institute since 2004. He has previously worked at Stanford University, the German Council of Economic Advisors and Deca Bank. Since 2001, he's held the honorary professorship for economics at the European Business School. He's also a member of the EU Commission's Refit platform and vice chairman of the board of the Atlantic Brücke. He was awarded the Order of Merit of the, German, uh, of the Federal Republic of Germany by the President of the Republic. Michael Hutter holds a PhD in economics and history from the Justus Liebig University in Gießen. And Adam Posen has been president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics since January 2013. Over his career, he's contributed to research and public policy regarding monetary and fiscal policies in the G20, European integration since the adoption of the euro, China-US economic relations, and new approaches to financial recovery and stability. Before his current position, he served a three-year term as an external voting member of the Bank of England's rate-setting monetary policy committee. He was made an honorary commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire and also received the order of the rising sun from the government of Japan. He received his BA and PhD from Harvard University. Uh, with that, it's a pleasure to um, give the floor to Dr. Brantner. And Dr. Brantner, um, if you'd like to say some words about Ukraine, please do. And then, and, and then uh, other uh, remarks more generally about our topic today. So look forward to your hearing from you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and you know, it's uh, it's crazy times. 
Um, and I'm very happy uh, that we have been working very closely with your administration, with our European partners on setting up a joint sanctions uh, system um, and be ready. Uh, you know, all of us had hoped that uh, Vladimir Putin wouldn't go the extra mile, but one must also recognize that he has already gained quite a bit uh, when you look at the uh, situation, uh, you have soldiers in Belarus, um, that you have uh, and difficulties for the Ukrainian uh, economy, uh, when you know it's politically difficult in, in, in Ukraine, it's, um, and uh, uh, that even by, you know, having the gas crisis and the gas prices in Europe uh, go so high, and he has also got some additional revenue um, you know, so already by uh, by having all of this, um, uh, he has already made some success. But on the other side, I think that we have also been successful um, in showing our unity and being clear and ready to act. Um, and I think that uh, you know, when the goal of uh, Vladimir Putin was to be to divide the West, I think uh, that we have further united. Um, and uh, that this is something uh, that always requires work because it's nothing God given, and that we have done this work over the last couple of weeks and months. Um, I can say for my house, as you said, uh, we are responsible when it comes to Nord Stream 2, uh, the pipeline. Uh, there is, a, of course, an official uh, procedure with uh, the German. Um, uh, net uh, agency um, that is still, uh, you know, it's on hold because the company has been changing. They have hired it to be a European company, not a Swiss one. Uh, but in addition to this, there's a report by our house on uh, the impact on um, energy uh, security in terms of uh, supply um, to not just Germany, but the EU. Um, and the previous government had given a report uh, in October last year, and we have today withdrawn that report um, and will have to draw a new assessment uh, because of uh, what happened since October. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, an important step um, and that we will um, look at it very closely. Uh, and, and you know, I think it's uh, it's important that we as Europeans really uh, do this in sync with our American partners, the Canadians, Australians, that we you know have an alliance that is broad. Um, and we should also see that uh, we have had this crisis now over the last couple of weeks and months. Uh, but we also have um, a a bit less. Uh, loud, but also still ongoing, a smaller crisis uh, when it comes to China and Lithuania. Uh, you might have noticed this, um, that we have very arbitrary, not very transparent um, sanctions against not just uh, Lithuanian companies, but German companies or Swedish companies or any European company that has um, some production steps uh, in Lithuania. Um, so we, you know, we we should not forget uh, what other uh, challenges are when it comes uh, to difficulties. And then, um, you know, now I maybe come to <laughs> the prospects uh, for our, uh, our cooperation um, uh, is that you know we are determined to have a two transformation and combine it well, digital and the climate uh, carbon neutral. Um, process to really set us off on the right track uh, so that we can become carbon neutral, not just Germany, Europe, but hopefully worldwide. Uh, and as well that we can, you know, take all the benefits from digitalization and make sure that we do not lose out on it. Um, and that we hope that we can work together on this with our American partners, with the uh, um, you know, with those who are willing to work together um, in that in that journey, and I think it's uh, good that we have um, new opportunities, uh, you know, with new administration, uh, really to to see this uh, as a joint challenge, um, and not to see it as a, something that will make trade more complicated. But we have to do it together. Um, and allow me more precisely to speak about the European-US Trade and Technology Council, 
uh, which has been uh, important for us to see that we had the first summit um, and that we really, you know, look there at uh, the different transatlantic partnership issues. Um, and we need to focus on, you know, export controls, investment screens, secure supply chains, standard setting for new technologies, um, cooperation for methodologies for carbon footprints, um, that we do talk there very clearly on how this could work. Um, and how do we deal with distortions from actors that I just mentioned before? Um, and also, you know, allow you say that we want to re regulate digital companies in Europe, um, but we do this because we believe that we need to uh, create stronger competition again in this market and that we need to protect our citizens and I must say our democracy. Um, and that we really have an interest in regulating these companies. And it's in, independent on where they are located. Um, and and uh, that is part of our agenda. Uh, and I think that we will hopefully uh, also get similar, uh, maybe regulation in the US. Um, and then we have issues that uh, the US representatives have been addressing with uh, the EU Commission on supply chain export controls. Um, and especially when it comes to supply chains, I think we could cooperate more and more intensively in order to ensure that we, you know, continue trading, um, but also get to new, uh, to a new level of security, um, which I think is highly necessary. Um, and when it comes to China, allow me to say that we have three aims that we do share or where I think we are in sync. It's a reciprocity and access to the Chinese market, um, procurement, um, second, a level playing field in our competition with China, uh, and third, sustainable supply chains. Uh, and there I want to add that particularly on when it comes to forced labor. Uh, so I think that we need to have closer coordination and cooperation on this, and that we have to establish more dialogues uh, in order to see how we can foster here our cooperation. Um, also, by the way, maybe revitalize the WTO um, and get into a more strategic approach. Um, so, you know, I think that if we do it well, we have stronger economies and more well-being in a couple of years at the end of, uh, you know, a good decade, I hope. Um, and that we will have shown that we defend our liberal democracies at home and abroad. Uh, and I think geoeconomics uh, is a very strong dimension of it. Um, and I think that we in the new administration are very much aware that geoeconomics is part of it and that we must get better in that, uh, in that um, dimension. Thank you very much, Dr. Brandner. Let me um, uh, give the floor now to Michal Hüter. Yeah, many thanks for inviting me and uh, let me start with a more general perspective. 30 years ago, 30 years ago, it was that um, Henry Can Kissinger... Like Köln or else? Sorry? Can you hear me? Sure, because there was an interruption. Um, the general perspective started with uh, uh, Arthur Burns' lecture from Henry Kissinger in the year 1992, he gave him Frankfurt. And he said in his fifth Arthur Burns lecture, just after uh, three years after the breakdown of the Iron Curtain, that for transatlantic cooperation, that's our topic today, there's a need for reformulation of a common purpose. We, we have to define projects, common projects for the future. Otherwise, this transatlantic cooperation will drain of content. And I think it was uh, a fantastic vision 30 years ago. And today we have to realize that the peace dividend period is over after the breakdown of the uh, Cold War conflict. I think it's a, a very important point that we are discussing about transatlantic cooperation with the new government in Germany and the Biden administration and for, for, the, for the years ahead, we have to, to reassess what we learned in the last 30 years. We were not really able to define new projects. Uh, we had two big, perspectives from this uh, period 30 years ago. The first perspective was to integrate Russia economically and politically in, in, the, in the systems we already had. And we failed to integrate Russia into our economic system. Russia is still a, a very weak uh, economy 
it's based on, on natural resources, nothing else. More than 50% of the exports from uh, Russia are uh, raw materials and, and resources, natural resources. 60% of the imports of Russia are machinery equipment, chemical and other product, products. So the, the structural change of the Russian economy did not have much to know. Um, the second perspective we had 30 years ago was based on the modernization hypothesis that China, after a long period of free trade integration, will become a democracy in the end of the day. George Bush Senior, as president, said this in the, year, in the same year when uh, Kiss, Kiss, Kissinger, Henry Kissinger gave his uh, Arthur Burns lecture. I think it's just, we have to see that on both sides, we are in a very different world. Um, we have a system conflict. We are back to a perspective of global power competition. And the question is, what's the common purpose of the transatlantic West? And what is the division of labor? What's the division of risk sharing on both sides of the Atlantic? And uh, do we have really a good starting point for cooperation for the, for the future? Um, if we want to cooperate, we have to invest on both sides. For the United States government, the administration must be quite clear that looking at uh, over the Atlantic is even more important than looking at, over the uh, Pacific Ocean. And for Germany and Europe as well, it's quite clear that you have to try to, different, uh, to reach a different setting of burden sharing. Um, I would say that the uh, European Defense Union would be a starting point for different cooperation. If you're looking on the coalition agreement on the new federal government in Germany, all is colored in European uh, blue so to say. Uh, everything was said, it's, it's fine, I totally agree with that, but I would say at the end of the day, uh, we need a little bit more realistic on the international security aspect. And I think this is maybe a starting point to make Europe as the second pillar of transatlantic cooperation, also in the perspective of common defense activity. That's one point. The other is in which way we can handle, and um, Francisca Brandner already stressed this, due to this, the structural change. Our goal to reach a situation of climate neutrality in 2045 or 2050 or China 2060, it's more or less the same. Let's say in the middle of the century, we want to have a climate neutral situation. Um, we are uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the starting position, Germany, that our industrial sector is, is on the way for transformation. He is starting already, but he has a long way to go. But he may a little bit, can use as a master to understand in which way an advanced economy that can tackle this, this challenge and can go ahead. Digital transformation is a very important precondition to be successful in this transformation. Um, and we need a common perspective on that. Uh, and one question, uh, Peter, you, you want to stress later on, maybe but I mentioned it here, is the idea of a, a climate club. Because I think the international cooperation need a new framing. It's not so easy to do it on the level of the United Nations, but the club idea, I think, is, is worthwhile to discuss on. And, and if uh, North America, I think, on the United States and Canada, but Australia, European Union, I will start to, to create such a um, new uh, climate club would be really one of these projects uh, Henry Kissinger asked for 30 years ago. So the defense cooperation in new quality is, is one. The climate club is another one. And we should be quite clear, and that's my last and third point in the introductory remarks, that in the system conflict era, in the system, in the, in the situation of global power competition, we should be aware that not only our economic system is under pressure, but also our political system. The German understanding or the Western understanding is that market economy or democracy and market economy and market economy and democracy are uh, the two sides of one coin. With the two sides of one coin. They are coming from the early modern. Uh, modernization phase in the end of the 18th century, the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, the American Revolution, the, the, uh, the, 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 the perspective that the individual will have a group for acting in freedom and responsibility. And this is under stress. And this is under conflict. And this system conflict has to be addressed. Uh, so we have to realize that globalization is, this is different to, to the situation 30 years ago, is a normative conflict. It's a conflict in between the Chinese way, in powerful economic terms, and the Western style way. And Russia is just in between. Russia is, uh, as I said, a weak economy, uh, but a little bit stronger on military terms and in, in, in uh, defense, or better to say, the, to attack um, something. But um, the big conflict has to be solved between 
China and the transatlantic West. So that should be the third purpose of the third project for a new defining, a new defined transatlantic cooperation as an answer to Henry Kissinger, the questions he, he put 30 years ago in Frankfurt. Thank you, Mikhail Hutta. Adam Posen, over to you, please. Thank you, Peter. And uh, again, thank you to Jeff and AICGS for pulling together this group. I'm honored to be with Mikhail and the Staatssekretär on this occasion. It's funny that Mikhail starts with the uh, Kissinger Burns lecture in 1992. At that point, I was studying in Germany, uh, interning at the Bundesbank, and I actually managed to worm my way into that lecture uh, there in Frankfurt. Um, and I, I think the idea of projects is another way of saying finding uh, common priorities, I guess. And, and along with the two co-panelists, I, I agree that essentially energy and climate change and constraining China's ability to compel or coerce us uh, are the two main projects for us to pursue. I think um, there is not much for me to say from an economic front on the Ukraine decisions, except to send my sincere thanks and admiration to the Bundeswehr Gerung and Councillor Schultz for standing up on Nord Stream 2 or against Nord Stream 2 in this situation. As brave as that is, in a sense, the dealing with Russia in this situation is in some ways politically more easy, as tough as it seems. And I know Staatssekretär and her colleagues have a tough job. But in the end, when we think back to transatlantic relations, when you have a very overt common security threat, it's much easier to get things aligned. What's going to be more difficult is sustaining alignment uh, and sustaining mutual progress over the span of decades. Um, and that is crucially important, uh, especially if through common transatlantic action, we are able to convince Russia and behind that China that militarily imposed changes of borders are not acceptable in the European realm or in, frankly, in the any realm. If we do that, then we are in a period of extended stasis, not Cold War, but, but stasis and competition, stasis geographically, competition economically for the long run. And so I think the two or three points I would make are, I'm not that vague, it's just up to the audience where you consider them two or three. First is that it is right, uh, Michael mentioned the notion of clubs, it is right that we have to get past undue um, fetishization of the multilateral institutions. As was always the case in transatlantic relations, multilateralism was a means to an end, and it was never a um, true multilateralism to the extent it is now in that the Soviets and their allies were excluded from decision-making except at the UN, basically. And so we, we never had the kind of paralyzed system, um, or rather when India or Brazil were paralyzing the system, uh, the Europe and the US went around them. Um, so I think we have to focus more on the common values than on the institutions. And that in a sense is the realist approach to international economics as opposed to the definitively institutionalist approach. The institutions are useful but only as expressions of underlying values and interests. The second point I would make is, and this is something I've been trying to develop, is that we may have to um, sacrifice, in a sense, trade and to make progress on other more important issues. Um, the political salience of trade, particularly in the US domestic context, but elsewhere, including in Europe, has gone up so much and yet we have not so much to show for it. Uh, this is not to say there shouldn't be the Trade and Technology Council and all the rest of it, but just to say that it is far more important what we do on migration, far more important what we do on cross-border investment, far more important what we do on regulatory standards and finance, and far more important what we do in terms of labor and especially environmental standards 
than what we do at actual trade opening goods and services debates over access to particular markets back and forth. Um, and this is true from both an economic and foreign policy point of view in my vision. And frankly, despite the spike of interest in the, uh, for example, ISDS several years ago in Europe, and frankly, the very constructive uh, proposal coming out of Germany to take the adjudication of investor state dispute settlement out of the sort of corporate hands, um, that is not really something we need to worry about the public diverting us on. The third point I would make is that um, Germany, by being more supportive of an integrated European fiscal approach in recent years, except not willing to change the rules, but de facto doing so in the face of the COVID environment, is making a big contribution. I think German policymakers to this day don't quite understand or appreciate just how badly even pre-Trump under the Obama administration and in general, the, um, the churlishness of German economic policy towards the European South during the crisis and the accumulation of imbalances played out. But that, by that notion, it is meaningful not just for European and the Euro area's viability that Germany has made much more constructive, realistic motions on intra-European policies and on its own fiscal policies in recent years. The final point I would raise, which people might think is obvious and but I think has to be put up there on the table is it's one thing for the Staatssekretär to speak quite reasonably about relationship with the Biden administration of the new German, new German government, but ultimately the US is not a reliable partner um, at present. Uh, given the state of Congress on foreign policy issues, given the risk of an anti-democratic government coming in in 2022 or 2024. And so I think well-minded people in Europe have to think about what you do if the US goes back to a more anti-globalist, anti-democratic position, as it seems unfortunately likely to do at least temporarily, and how people in the US, including those in the current administration, can prepare against that. And maybe that's something we can discuss. Thank you very much. Adam, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, and just a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, I'm going to lead off now with some questions for the panelists to uh, get a conversation going. If And then I would like to open up the, the um, the event to all of the viewers. If you'd like to ask a question, please do. Uh, you, please use the uh, Q&A tab, which you'll find on your screen, and I'll try to get to your questions. Um, let, me, let me start with what I think is a common thread that I heard um, going through all of your remarks. And this, I, and I, I think, and it, it, I think it's this kind of um, interaction or or coexistence of geopolitics and geoeconomics. And let me let me drill down a little more specifically to a case in point, um, and that is what is uh, not Ukraine, but rather it's because it's a bit more in the economic realm, or it mixes these two realms. What China has been uh, doing in the case of Lithuania's decision to rename it the Taiwan Representative Office. So. Um, this is, I think, an interesting case because it is um, uh, a situation where the European Union has actually proposed a, 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 an instrument to deal with exactly this kind of problem, the anti-coercion uh, tool. Uh, it's not ready yet, but it, it, is, it is, I think, a notable development because it is, um, I think, if, if it's accepted, it would be a way for the EU to act in a bit more, a bit more like a global power in the economic realm, but of course it raises an issue, I think, which is how much should uh, and Adam, you you touched on this, I think, when you talked about the WTO. How much should can and should be done uh, by the European Union, the United States, the two of them working together in the Trade and Technology Council, or perhaps with Japan in the trilateral initiative? How much should how much should, can or should be done that way in order to deal with this, the kind of more um, conflictual like a global economy we have? And how much um, should be uh, still done in, in a multilateral institution like the, like the WTO? And I asked this question 
maybe I'm, I'm, I'm even more uh, sort of motivated to ask the question based on what you just said, Adam, about the situation in the United States, because if the United States is going to become a less reliable ally, how much, if you're sitting in Berlin or in Brussels, how much, in fact, should, um, should Europeans rely on bilateral or trilateral mechanisms? And rather, isn't it smarter to put their more stock in something institutional like the WTO? Perhaps, Peter, you're allowing me to respond Please. first. Obviously. Um, so I think this is one of those occasions where one can pursue multiple aspects at once because, say, a WTO case is not that difficult. This is where I get skeptical about the WTO is multilateral agreements you know, to broadly open trade routes, for example. But the idea that the WTO can enforce present rules is something the WTO does very well. So I think you can do that. In terms of the US, and I agree with you, the example of what to do with the Chinese threats right now, singling out an EU member is entirely right. Um, the, I think you can take advantage, the issue is gonna be for the foreseeable future, uh, the economic analog to what was true with NATO in the Cold War, right? That Germany and Europe would always be a little upset if the US were too aggressive towards the Soviet Union, but then would be upset if the US seemed to be pulling back. So it's going to be that ongoing give and take. But, and so, so when it comes to being aggressive with China right now, the, the your EU will probably be pushing on an open door. When it comes to defending the viability of Taiwan, stopping short of public statements challenging Chinese ultimate dominion, it will, be, it will be a welcome thing. I think where the Europe having to stand alone or build itself up, I think is rightly this effort to create a European level response when one member of it is singled out. And I think that is something that's both in Europe's interest and also likely to be very powerful for rallying people around the European Union. So in this one case, and there are others, I think three tracks are possible without in any way overextending state capacity. There are obviously issues where that's not possible, but in this case, the three tracks run together. May I add to this, Peter? Yeah, please. Um, you will see this, my, my starting year today is 1992, because again here in 1992, Bill Clinton on the presidential election in the United States and he came into office. And the first question was, will he able to reach an agreement on the Uruguay round. And then the Uruguay round was finished, the WTO was settled, and the, the, the expectation was that no, it's a period of multilateral institutions, multilateral order. Then we realized that beginning in the second half of the 1990s, even more in the years after 2000, that bilateral and regional agreements are even more important. Today, we have not really a perspective of new, of a restarting or, res, or something like a res, reset for the WTO, because there's a conflict towards China, there's a conflict uh, between the uh, United States and the other in the appellation body and the nomination for members of the appellation body. So what we all are doing is that special clubs are coming together, working like a, a substitute solution. And I think this is a, a feature of our time that the hope on, for multi, multilateral uh, institution, multilateral rules-based international order is still important and it's outlined in the coalition agreement. I think it's at, at several points in the coalition agreement, I totally agree, but this is not what we will see for the near future. We will see the cooperation inside clubs for different purpose. Yeah? Europe has to be more than um, uh, what it just is. It has to be also, I would say, an investment union. It has to be also like a an, an, an defense union. And in, behind the notion of investment union, for me, is the next generation EU fund as a constant second pillar for European financial activities for investment. So it's, we have to invest in the European common purpose and the common perspective. And together with the United States, we have to ask what could, what can we do together as in the idea of a climate club together with Canada. Uh, and in the, the, the new relaunch, the new launch of the, uh, what's the name, Trade and Technology Council, it's only of the, the second, third best, but it's at, at least it's a starting point instead of a TTIP discussion we had in Germany also very critically. So I think the, the problem is that, that in some is, 
institutions we already have in the European Union, for example, we have to, uh, to broaden our perspective, but you said with Lithuania and the conflict from China is coming. So we have to, to stay together and we have to make clear that these are the rules here. And we, we will they have to accept and we, we have to define what is the level playing field for international cooperation. But what we also see in the case of China and Taiwan is that it's more or less the same. China, Russia, but also the United States are looking on their, their spheres of influence. The regions of influence are around. In, not, but this is, it was the odd uh, setting of the Cold, uh, Cold War period, um, zones of influence. Uh, and this was something like a, an architecture for, for international security. And it may be different today, but we have to see that all they have their specific needs, but we have to define instead of that, uh, a common purpose in which we can cooperate in very different fields. I would say for the future, we need even more of this club idea because it is a first step to come then to a global solution. If the club is big enough, yeah, all the other one to be member of the club. So this is the idea of a club as we have all the other sporting club or the high standard, high quality uh, 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 public goods or, or club goods, which are defined in a very sound basis and, and reliable and so on. So there may be an incentive created from the club to be a member of a club for all the other. And that may be a, perspec a perspective for international cooperation for the next period. Dr. Brandner. Thank you. Uh, let me join on this question of the clubs, um, Mr. Hitler, because you also mentioned, you know, the climate club. The, the question is, how do we achieve climate uh, acceptable uh, industries? Um, so how do we decarbonize our industries without destroying them and having others produce still very uh, carbon heavy uh, steel, cement, etc., and imported it into our countries. Um, so the carbon leakage problem is a substantive one. And we have to find a resolution to that. Um, because if we don't, uh, you know, we, we might protect something, you know, we can destroy the German American industry and still haven't done anything for the climate. Uh, <laughs> so I think it's a very urgent um, and important question. And of course, the easiest way to solve it is to set equivalents of CO2 pricing mechanisms in uh, the EU, US, or China. Uh, but I don't believe that the US will anytime soon have a CO2 price. I'm like, I would love to, but I do somehow know my US, um, you know, I've done my master's at Columbia University. I've lived in the US for some time. I, I still have very dear friends and from whatever I hear, we are far from having a CO2 pricing mechanism in the US. So that's where the complications start. And that's why we came with the kind of idea of a climate club is to set up a forum where we can discuss, identify implicit and explicit equivalents to CO2 pricing. And that's really not trivial. It's highly complicated. Um, and it needs uh, serious work from all sides, but I say especially the US and the EU side, because you know, if you have the CO2 pricing, very easy, um, but you won't have it. So then we need to work on equivalents, implicit and explicit ones. Um, I hope the OECD will start that work process um, and uh, that we will get to results sooner than later. Uh, but, you know, I must say, I haven't heard the person who tells me this is exactly how it could work, Ms. Brackner. And I've spoken to quite a number of smart people um and uh, so you know it's a real challenge but i agree that we have to do it and um uh, that uh, whoever wants to join it will be an inclusive and open club um can join but it doesn't mean that we stop our european mechanism the cbam the carbon board adjustment mechanism um you know which basically will have um a pricing etc mechanism in it um and the second point you know when we talk about what are the big challenges the climate is one and there i think we can also invest jointly in technologies um and transfer and and make it faster to work together the second one is the digital and um you know there i think we have to make sure that we don't allow it to become even further a threat to our democracies um, you know, I think that it's a real challenge. Uh, how do we uh, deal with uh, so, much, so many lies, so many, you know, not just fake news, but really um, destabilizing 
influence uh, from inside outside um, and how do we uh, make sure that we can ourselves define and know how it works and be, be in power of our own data. Uh, and I think that is actually a joint challenge. Um, it's a challenge to the American democracy. It's a challenge to all European democracies. And we are in the middle of setting some legal standards for it. Um, and I hope uh, that it, uh, you know, it might become a joint agenda. Um, and as Mr. Hüter said, you know, we have done a first step with the recovery fund in investing in the European um, renewal, or at least you know, um, making sure that Europe doesn't break apart because of Corona. But I agree that we will need additional investment afterwards in more trans-European really infrastructure. Um, and it will be key because otherwise we will be back to what Mr. Posen said, the you know economically not so sound disbalances that we used to have um and i think that these are you know this will be an important discussion in germany in the eu uh but it might help if for example in the us the build banker uh package would pass you know <laughs> um if i may say so at this point i know it's a it's painful and difficult but i think you know we sort of have same similar hurdles to overcome um, and I agree that if we do not invest now in the infrastructure, in the participation of large parts of our population in these transformations, we will pay on both sides of the Atlantic a high price for it. Could I just piggyback on the State Secretary's points for, Brandner, for Dr. Brandner? Um, I really want to commend what she said about CBAM and US. I mean, I can assure you, working in Washington trying to push these issues, I unfortunately see the same thing. And, and that's the spirit in which I meant the US being an unreliable partner. Um, you know, that, that the Biden people, I'm sure, have come to you and will continue to come to you saying, and your European colleagues saying, look, there's no way we can do this. We've got elections. We can't do anything about the, the the carbon issues, that's why Build Back Better has passed. So please, please, please let us substitute this ridiculous subsidies for national technologies for having a clear equitable carbon price. And please, please, please don't put on CPAP. I mean, I'm just recapping for our audience what I know is the reality. And I think this is the prime example and perhaps the most important example where the US, to put it bluntly, has to be smacked upside the head by Europe and some other allies and say, no, you're not doing acceptable enough. And so I would encourage Europe to maintain its own high standards, maintain its high and rising carbon price, maintain the promise, not the threat of CBAM. And most importantly, just very calmly and matter of factly say to the US, you're not going to escape this if you just keep trying to come up with pretend measures. And it may or may not work in the short term, but it's the only hope in the long term. Um, just as you said, you know, external pressure on the U.S. to pass Build Back Better, I think in this area, even more so, where the U.S. is unreliable and it needs the, the what we used to say in the Japan business, the gaiatsu, the external pressure. Could I uh, follow up on on this issue of, of of the climate club? I wondered if 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 you any of you or all of you see the uh, agreement on steel and aluminum that the U.S. and the EU struck last year as a kind of um, incipient uh, uh, form of this climate club. Because if you look at the mandate, part of the mandate of this agreement is for the U.S. and the EU to come up with in in the next two years a kind of common definition of carbon intensity and methodology for measuring carbon intensity. And then they would take certain kinds of enforcement actions, um, perhaps outside the WTO, it's unclear, based on the, based on the, on that common methodology. Uh, that sounds to me a little bit like, like some of the goals of a climate club. And, yeah. and the second question I would have is, um, again, going back to the WTO, how important and realistic would it be for the US and the EU or members of a climate club to sort of be the vanguard for reform in the WTO so that world trade rules are uh, a little, perhaps a little more permissible when it comes to uh, members, member countries taking climate actions? 
maybe I can answer to that. Uh, um, I know you're totally right. For steel and aluminium, that's part of the mandate, um, and that's uh, precisely what they're supposed to work out. I think that would be, you know, this is this is su supposed to be then a basis for the rest. Um, but uh, you know, it's one sector. We will have uh, chemicals. We have cement. Um, and as you know, it's really not so easy to find all of these equivalents and how you measure, et cetera, if you don't go by a pricing element. Um, and as far as I know, the commission has put some of the smartest people on it <laughs> um, to work this out because you really want to have a good transatlantic, uh, you know, decarbonizing of our steel sector. Uh, and this should be the guiding the guiding principle in the end is to have a decarbonizing of our industry, of our steel, of our chemical industry, etc. The goal is not to have uh, a trade war between any countries. Uh, we have to achieve this together. Um, and we need our companies in the private sector to invest in these technologies. And they will not do it when they when we don't have a carbon leakage to prevent it. I'm like, they just will not. Why would they? Um, um, and uh, and, and I think, you know, that this is the duty of the American government and of our government uh, to make sure that it will not become a competitive disadvantage if you go into new technologies. Um, uh, and I think that is, uh, you know, economically rather sound. Um, and I hope we will find through this part on steel mechanism, maybe we'll find it on others. Maybe the other discussions will be in the OECD so that we have Australia and others as part of it, um, Japan, etc. We can make it even larger. Um, you know, I think on this one, China is important, um, but China has a pricing mechanism. So in a way, it is easier. Um, uh, and yes, to the second question on the WTO, I hope we will get some momentum during the G7 presidency. We also set this up uh, as a priority and really want to you know, develop joint approaches and um, get to WTO reform. Um, you know, let's see how active uh, we all will be. Yeah, maybe I can add some yes. arguments on the, on, um, on the WTO reform. Um, this has to be, there's needed a broader focus. We, we already discussed a bit about the appellation body. This is an institutional setting. Uh, on the other side, we have the investment agreement, but still not reached um, due to the um, uh, contraposition from, from India several years ago. The Doha round is really dead. So there's, we need something like a restart from their own, from the ideas of the uh, world trade order. And the problem is, that the WTO in itself is a very weak institution because it's only the secretary. It's not comparable to the IMF or the World Bank. If you uh, keep in mind that the general idea was just after the Second World War to have something similar for the Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, and something like an international trade. It was a gap in this, was an agreement. And the WTO, in the first one, cut the impression it is, had a stronger institutional setting, but in fact, it's not. They are sitting there in Switzerland, in Geneva, and it's, an, it's a small bureaucracy. Sometimes it's good to have a small bureaucracy, but here I would say they have no, no, no right to bring their own ideas on the table. So in WTO, is not the, 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 in the driver's seat. That's all the, the member states on the driver's seat or in the different cars with their only driver's seats. So your argument, Peter, that some of, the, of what started between Europe and Germany and the United States could be, um, could, in, could uh, explain an ex an, an perspect perspective on the climate club in, in the future to come, yes. And this may be also a starting point then to bring this to the WTO as an yeah, a new uh, joint project for all the other. But I think another point is very important for that. If the decarbonization will happen in the way in Germany as more or less as our idea is, as it's outlined in the coalition agreement, as it's outlined in the, in the, in the program or in the, in the reports from the Federal Ministry of Economy and Climate Protection, um, and we, we are able to make clear to the wider public around the world that our transformation is on the way. And the trans transformation is on the way that we will able to secure welfare here or wealth production here and high, high level jobs, high compensated jobs. And even in this very strong and tough and challenging transformation period, then I think it's the best argument for cooperation for the other. 
If the other gets the impression that we, 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 will, we will fail, then we have no argument to do it again. So I think it depends on our success and that could be a starting point for new give and take in all these international negotiations to, to reach a new agreement and a new perspective also in the WTO. But it's a long way to go. And again, we should not forget that we also have some, some uh, original topics in the WTO, the advanced progress and e-commerce, for example, or the information technology agreements. There's still something to do, which is also worthwhile and could underpin the, the, the smoothness of the structural change all around. I think the biggest thing to be done at WTO, frankly, is to pick up the trilateral subsidies code proposals that were developed in 2017 ahead of the 2018 ministerial by EU, Japan, and US jointly. I have very openly said to the Biden administration privately and publicly, I, this is a no brainer. Even Lighthizer of the previous administration thought about doing it. And now we are seeing a little bit of science USTR is willing to, to commerce, the, commerce, the uh, a counterpart to the Wirtschafts Ministerium uh, might do this. And that I think would be a huge thing. I'm not so worried about WTO reform. It's a code word, I think, in a lot of ways for stalemating the WTO and particularly in the US. Um, but I think the working together on the subsidies code where there's a good substantive proposal and a lot of overlap of interests among US, EU, Japan would be a great place to put the priority right now. Let me uh, go to a question from from the from the, one of the viewers. Uh, it gets back to what we were talking about more towards the beginning of the of our conversation, um, and um, perhaps Dr. Brantner, it's addressed to you. But I'd be interested if uh, the other speakers had comments. It, it asks, um, what is Germany thinking about promoting more uh, liquefied national uh, natural gas imports from the United States and other suppliers, and especially in terms of building new import facilities. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, as you know, we are um, in Germany heavily relying on gas imports from Russia, um, which hasn't been a major problem for many decades. Uh, but we have seen over this winter that it, uh, it might, in difficult situations, still have some, um, you know, some some risks for us. Um, so the question is, uh, firstly, how we can speed up our own energy transition in Germany to really speed up the rollout of renewable energies. And we want to speed up uh, the procedures for that because in Germany, uh, the problem that we are facing is that we really have um, way too long procedures. It takes years uh, to build <laughs> some of what we need. Uh, so to really speed up this. Um, and secondly, of course, then comes the question of new infrastructure uh, for hydrogen, which we have to build up because we will need it soon and we will have to build the infrastructure now. So that's what we're also speeding up. Um, and then thirdly comes the diversification when it comes to gas. By liquefied gas, we don't have a terminal yet. We do receive liquefied gas by the Netherlands, the Belgium, the, the, the joint port. Um, and the question is if we will need additional capacity to receive LNG. So far, it's not necessarily um, from only you know from the US, but sort of from Qatar, other places, or now ships coming you know from Japan, South Korea, etc. Um, um, and the question is there if we don't need uh, our own terminal which needs to be H2 ready. Um, so we need to not just build an infrastructure um, for gas, uh, liquefied gas, but one that will be uh, able, um, you know, it's not exactly the same, so you can't really, you know, you can't just pull a switch. It's a bit more complicated, but that the, the pipelines and the infrastructure, et cetera, will be hydrogen ready. Um, so it's not exactly the same that we are planning what used to be planned in the past. It's rather to look out to what we will need in the future. Um, it's time sensitive. Uh, so, you know, um, and because we will not see this tomorrow, what we also will do when it comes to better being prepared on gas um, in Germany, that's a German question. We don't have a, any regulatory way to uh, oblige companies to fill the gas storages, the gas reserves in Germany. 
um, and you've seen how risky this is uh, this winter. So we will put in regulatory measures uh, for um, making sure that our gas storages are full at the beginning of the winter. Um, and then last point, we will heavily invest in making our use and needs of gas smaller in the sector of heating, et cetera. So we have um, you know, quite a diversified approach to it. Um, and we don't want to you know, exchange one dependency for another, but work on using less diversification, getting better regulatory framework um, so that we can be safer in the next winters to come. Well, we need to close promptly at 11 here and um, five in Germany, uh, but I'd like to ask if uh, Michael Hutter Adam Posen have uh, any follow-up on that? Okay. I think that, as uh, Francisca said, it's a long way for the investment, for the infrastructure investment, but what I've, what I've heard is that just now the infrastructure um, will allow us to bring more LNG to Germany, to Europe. So there is still room for maneuver and room for acting, and the European uh, central level is, is working on that. So we are not so dependent on Russia gas as it seems in the first row, but you know, uh, it takes some, will take some time. Yeah. Well, um... Francisco Barante, Michael Huto, and Adam Posen, let me thank you very much for joining us today. We sort of ended where we started a little bit more in the headlines and in between, I think we covered a lot of ground on some present but also longer term issues that are facing both the United States and Germany and the broader transatlantic relations. And thank you for, for enriching all of our understanding on these issues. Uh, we hope to have you back to AICGS um, at some time in the future. Uh, let me thank all of our viewers for tuning in today and, and then wish you all a good uh, morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Thanks a lot.